I am really, really pleased to introduce Dr. Gordon Dale, who is the inaugural Dr. Jack Gottlieb Scholar in Jewish Music Studies at Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. Hi, Gordon, where he serves as an assistant professor of Jewish musicology in the Debbie Friedman School of Sacred Music. He's also the executive director of the Jewish Music Forum, which is a project of the American Society for Jewish Music and is a past president of the Society for Ethnomusicology's Special Interest Group for Jewish Music. So I think we have a subject matter expert. Um, his latest research has focused on music in the Hasidic communities of New York and Israel with publications on topics ranging from Ishai Ribo to Avinu Malkeinu to Orthodox voice choirs. And he's lectured and continues to lecture across the U.S. on topics relating to Israeli pop music, Jewish music, and mysticism. He is, you'll be glad to know, finishing up his first book, which deals with, uh, in much more depth, with the subject of today's talk. So if you are left wanting more, you'll look out for that book. It's called The Life and Complete Works of Rabbi Ben Zion Schenker. And it has already received recognition from the Association for Jewish Studies with a Jordan Schnitzer First Book Publication Award. So with that, Gordon, I wanna hand things over to you and invite everyone please to submit your questions and I'll see you in a bit. Hello and thank you. Thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, I'd like to thank the Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies for their kind invitation and for the behind the scenes work making these programs possible. I particularly want to thank Dr. Ann Albert, Diana Dennis Walters, and Brian Lipscomb for your work on this series. Uh, I'm very happy that you've put a spotlight on Nigunim, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute to the knowledge that emerges from these programs. And finally, I want to thank all of you who are here today. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day to be here. So in this installment of the series, I'd like to situate our discussion primarily in the 20th and 21st centuries, as we discuss the life of a particularly important performer and composer of Nigunim, Rabbi Benzion Shanker. If Benzion Shanker is not a familiar name to you, have no fear. Uh, first, it's entirely possible that you know some of Shanker's music, even if you don't know who composed it. Secondly, my focus on Schenker's life is directed toward a broader topic within the study of Nigunim. Today, I'd like to think of Schenker as a window into the life of the Nigun repertoire so that we understand the transmission of Nigunim in the 20th century and how Nigunim came to be preserved in post-World War II Hasidism in America. That is to say, my discussion about Ben Sian Schenker is not just about this remarkable musician. It's also about how Nigunim travel how they are preserved, and how the genre itself, beyond the individual pieces, is maintained, adjusted, and propelled forward. Toward that end, today I'll be organizing my discussion of Shanker's life into five parts. I'll call them stanzas, just as we call each constituent part of a nigun, with each one contributing a new musical dimension to the whole. Each of these stanzas of Shanker's life gives us, I believe, a glimpse into the transmission of nigunim. My talk today, therefore, is not direct, designed to present a comprehensive picture of Schenker's life. Rather, I wish to highlight certain aspects that bring the issue of transmission into high relief so that we can, in the context of this lecture series on Nigunim, think about how Nigunim are transmitted both through space and time. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that Schenker is single-handedly responsible for maintaining and continuing the Nigun genre in America or anything of the sort. I do, as I'll explain, believe that he played a particularly important role in relation to a specific Hasidic dynasty's musical canon, which in turn inspired other musical activities. But I come at this question of transmission through biography because transmission is, at its core, about relationships. Viewed in this way, we can see transmission not as simply a chain in which links connect one to the next, but instead is a complex web of relationships through which music is shared, learned, and changed, and additional layers of meaning acquired. Like all relationships, 
Those in the web of music transmission are shaped through world events, as well as various technologies, whether simple, such as pen and paper, or more complex, such as digital recording and internet communications. Shanker lived for 91 years, from 1925 to 2016 in Brooklyn, New York, watching as the borough became one of the world's hubs for Hasidic life. And as we'll see, music ran through the entirety of his life. Let's take a look at the role that he played in the transmission of Nigunim during this time. Before we can get into Vinci and Shanker's life, let's say a bit about his parents, Miriam and Mordecai. Miriam was raised in Chelm, a town that had been mythologized as being a town of fools, but more accurately, was actually an active center of commerce in Poland. Miriam's family, the Shafrins, followed the Kutzker Hasidic dynasty, with her father, Yechiel, frequently leaving for weeks at a time to be with the Kutzker Rebbe, while Miriam's mother, Edel Hena, ran a small business, likely a fish market. Mordechai Schenker's family lived in Biskowitz, a small town outside of Lublin. They're a Hasidim of the Trisker dynasty, which was one of the branches of the Chernobyl line. When Mordechai was just 13 years old, his father passed away, leaving his mother Bracha to support the family. During those years, Mordechai spent much of his time in the home of the community's rabbi, immersing himself in Torah study under the rabbi's tutelage. The couple were married and in 1921 came to America. Miriam's father, Yechiel Shafrin, had come to America years earlier and essentially uh, had somewhat been stuck in New York because of World War I. Rather than returning to his family in Europe, his daughter Miriam and her new husband joined him in New York, which also had the advantage of helping to make sure that Mordechai would not be drafted into the Polish army. The couple initially settled in the Lower East Side, but moved to Williamsburg, Brooklyn after having a few small children. It was in Williamsburg that, in 1925, Vincent Shanker was born. Vincent credited his mother as creating a highly musical environment in their home. Miriam was a skilled singer, he told me, and the family purchased recordings of cantorial music, which Benzion listened to endlessly. By four or five years old, Schenker was singing Yassel Rosenblatt pieces to the delight of his neighbors, complete with the coloratura runs that were idiomatic to the style. In his early years, Schenker also began to learn Nigunim. His father, who often led the prayers in their synagogue, sang Nigunim that he had learned in Europe at home around the Shabbos table. Schenker's musical skill was noticed by others as well. At around the age of 12, cantor Joshua Weiser was visiting the synagogue that Schenker's family attended and heard Ben Sion singing along with the Shaliach Tzibor, the leader of the prayers. Impressed, Weiser went over to Ben Sion and asked to speak with his father. Schenker made the introduction and Weiser explained that he ran a Jewish boys choir that trained young singers. He asked Mordechai Schenker to permit Ben Sion to join. Mordechai refused, saying that choirs were not a good environment for a young yeshiva student like Ben Sion. Weiser pushed harder, and Mordechai told Weiser that he should really speak with his wife, Miriam, Ben Sion's mother. Sure enough, Weiser turned up at their door to make his case. After Weiser promised that when traveling, Ben Sion would always stay in the home of the community's rabbi, Mordechai and Miriam consented. The decision turned out to have a positive impact on his musical development. Ben Sion learned a great deal from Weiser, who would train many other young singers, including the famed opera star, Richard Tucker. In addition, these stays in rabbis' homes exposed Shanker to many nagunim, which he claimed had a significant impact on him. Shortly later, Shanker also began singing on WEVD, a popular Yiddish radio station. Though it was highly unusual for a yeshiva student, Schenker received permission from his teacher, Rabbi Avraham Palm, and the head of the school, Rabbi Shraga Feivel Mendelovitz, to leave his studies to go sing. These rabbis instructed Schenker that he was to go straight from school to the radio station, arrive there just in time to sing, and then return immediately after he concluded. Like the agreement that Schenker's parents had reached with Joshua Weiser, the rabbi's instructions were designed to minimize his exposure to ideas and cultural productions that were seen as inappropriate according to his community standards. To fulfill their wishes, Schenker would study pieces written by composers such as Abraham Elstein and Shalom Secunda with Weiser, 
and learn them well enough to not need a rehearsal with a pianist at the radio station. He would then come to the station, sing with the accompanist for the first time live on air. In addition to his studies with Leiser, Schenker benefited from studying piano at the Henry Street Settlement, an institution that to this day is based on the Lower East Side and offers services and programming to the public. And he also studied music with Seymour Silbermans, who would grow up to be the music director at Kahal Adat Yashurin for nearly 40 years. Thus, by his teenage years, Schenker had extensive musical performance experience and was acquiring skills in music theory, transcription, and composition. In 1940, Schenker had an encounter that would change the course of his life as it placed Nigunim at the center of his musical world. In 1940, Schenker learned that Rabbi Shaul Yedidya Taub, known as the Majitzer Rebbe, had arrived in New York. To set the scene, let's step back and get something of an appreciation for who Rabbi Taub was and the dynasty that he led. Now, as uh, you may know, the Hasidic community is composed of many dynasties, each led by a rabbi known as the Rebbe. Following the death of the originator of the Hasidic movement, the Baal Shem Tov, in or around the year 1760, his students, and even more so the following generation of students of his teachings, spread uh, around Europe. The rabbinic leader of each of these communities was referred to as the Tzadik, meaning a holy person, or also known as a Rebbe. Each Hasidic Rebbe led his students in the path of the Baal Shem Tov in his own unique way, each emphasizing different ways of serving God. Followers of the Rebbe's were not necessarily bound by geography and generally maintained allegiance to a dynasty after a Rebbe's passing. In these cases, the mantle of leadership was usually, though not always, taken up by the son of a Rebbe. Among the early Hasidic leaders was Rabbi Ichesko Taub of Kuzmir, and here we'll see some of the prehistory of the Majid's dynasty. The Kuzmir Rebbe, as he was known, was first a student of the Kuznetzer Magid and later the seer of Lublin, Rabbi Yaakov Yitzchak Kalevi Horowitz, who in turn was a student of the Baal Shem Tov's primary disciple, Rabbi Dovber of Mezrich. The Kuzmir Rebbe was known to be a formidable Torah scholar, but it's likely his love of music that is his longest lasting contribution to Hasidism. It said that he could not welcome the Sabbath each week without a new nigun. The Kuzmir Rebbe's second oldest son, Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu Taub, moved to the nearby town of Zvolin, where he attracted a, a crowd of Hasidim. The Zvoliner Rebbe, as he was known, was, like his father, a talented musician. However, his music making came to an abrupt halt. He announced one day that the responsibility of singing to God was too great and he stopped singing forever. The statement is mysterious to be sure, but his Hasidim believed that their holy Rebbe was tapping into spiritual realities that were imperceptible to most people. Now, one of the Zvoliner's uh, Rebbe's sons, Rabbi Yisroel Taub, the second son, moved to the town of Deblin, Poland, around the year 1889, where he established the Majitz dynasty, drawing on the name of the town used by the Jewish community there. Rabbi Yisrael Taub, the first Majitzer Rebbe, also known as the Divrei Yisrael, after the title of his commentary on the Torah, carried on the family legacy of musical talent. His nigunim were remarkable compositions. In addition to the short, heartfelt pieces or dance melodies that were common to other Hasidic groups, the Majitzer Rebbe expanded the nigun genre significantly by creating lengthy through composed pieces. The first Majitzer Rebbe is said to have composed several hundred nigunim, several of which remain known across the Hasidic world to this day. Upon his death in 1920, Rabbi Yisrael Taub was succeeded by his son, Rabbi Shaul Yedidya Taub. He too was both a brilliant Torah scholar and a natural musician. Majitzer Hasidim estimate that he comp composed close to a thousand nigunim during his lifetime. Like his father, the Imre Shaul, as he's known, composed numerous lengthy pieces. In response to one such composition, one of the Hasidim declared, that's not a nigun, that's an opera. And to this day, the Majitz community has a series of pieces known as operas, which they consider part of their canon of nigunim. The Imre Shaul was the leader of the Majitz dynasty during the years of World War II and had a circuitous route as he fled the Nazis. While that story, and it's remarkable, is beyond our scope today, for today's purposes, we'll just say that 
uh, after a trip around the globe in 1940, he finally landed in America, first in San Francisco, and then finally in New York in early October. On this first Shabbos that Reb Shaul was in Brooklyn, October 12th to 13th, 1940, that is, the Rebbe was invited to a tish, a Hasidic gathering at which nigunim are sung and religious teachings are shared. That was to be held in his honor at a synagogue in Williamsburg. Benzion Shanker, then 15 years old, attended the event. Shanker was living in Bedford-Stuyvesant at the time, but would go to Williamsburg to attend the Rebbe's musical Saturday night gatherings following this. These were gatherings known as Malave Malkas. Now, six months later, Shanker learned that the Rebbe was planning to spend Shabbos in Bedford-Stuyvesant, close to where the Shankers lived. Following the prayer service on Saturday morning, Fensiun and his father went over to the Rebbe to wish him a good Shabbos. The Rebbe noted that he recognized them from the Malave Malkas, though they hadn't spoken before. He invited Benzion's father to join him at the Shabbos meal that was being hosted in his honor. Mordechai Shanker instructed Benzion to go home for the meal, but to come back to the host's house in time to bench, that is to say the blessings that follow the meal at the Rebbe's meal. Shanker did so, and when he arrived to find the meal stood continuing, he took a seat on a couch behind where the Rebbe was singing and found there a book called Mechassidim Mizmor by Mayor Shimon Geshuri. Included in the book was a short biography of the Majitsa Rebbe and notation of some of his nigunim. Shankar began to sight read the, no the notation, singing softly to himself. The Rebbe overheard, looked over, and asked Benzion to continue reading. The Rebbe was shocked to hear a young person sight reading music. Benzion noted that though he was 15, he looked even younger. At the Rebbe's encouragement, Benzion sang through one nigun after another that was found in the book. When it came time to say the blessings to continue the meal, to conclude the meal, the Rebbe asked Ben Sion to lead the first part, Psalm 126, which precedes the rest of the blessings. It's customary to sing this psalm aloud as a group, either to a melody that's specifically written for this text or to another melody using it as contrafact. Ben Sion decided to sing the text to a melody written by the Rebbe that he had learned recently. Shank Shankar learned the melody from a Lubavitcher chassid who had recently arrived in America, having fled the war in Europe. The Lubavitcher had learned the melody from the Majitsa Rebbe in Europe and brought it with him to America. The melody was a relatively recent composition and the Rebbe was shocked when he heard the song, amazed that his nigun had reached the United States before he had. Singing this nigun for the Rebbe made Ben Sion nervous and he gradually sped up as he sang. After he finished, the Rebbe decided to give him a lesson in proper nigun performance, saying, when you sing a nigun, you got to sing it like a clock, tick, tock, tick, tock, not like a train, choo, 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 quickly accelerating in tempo. I find this story remarkable in the picture that it paints of how nigunim traveled during World War II. I want to note here that we see two different forms of nigun transmission. Firstly, we see oral transmission, which was the case of the nigun that Benzion heard from the Lubavitcher, who in turn heard it from the Majitsa Rebbe. In the midst of the war, which was a time of dispersion, the non-tangible cultural artifacts of, cultural or sep of culture are separated from their source, but travel with individuals. In this story, we have the reuniting of the nigun with the composer through this American-born musician. The second form of transmission that we see here is written notation. The writing down of nigunim was an important aspect of preserving and spreading nigunim, particularly in the Second World War. This is a point that the Rebbe believed in strongly. In fact, while running from the Nazis in Europe, the Rebbe recruited help from those with strong transcription skills, asking them to help notate Majitz or Nigunim, uh, because the Rebbe himself was unable to read or write music despite having uh, written nearly a thousand pieces. And that collection of nigunim that were transcribed during this time became known as the Vilna Notes. Stanza two, musical secretary to the Majitsa Rebbe. The writing down of nigunim proved to be an important project that the Majitsa Rebbe wanted to continue now that he had arrived in America. He recruited Bintin Shankar to be his musical secretary, a job that entailed sitting with the Rebbe and transcribing his compositions and those of the Majitsa Canon. 
to give a sense of uh, his responsibilities, let's talk about one surprising task that came in 1945. Bintan attended an event with his close friend, Rabbi Moshe Wolfson, who today is considered one of the greatest living masters of Hasidic mysticism. It was at this event that Schenker had the solemn honor of singing a piece titled Ani Ma'amin, I Believe, which is now the most among the most famous pieces of Hasidic music. Oh, here we see Bintan and the Manjata Rebbe. Shankar told the story of Ani Ma'amin in the following way. I'm quoting from him here. In the spring of 1945, there was a bris of a grandchild of the Rebbe, to which he invited a number of notables, people who he was close to, like the Kapitchnasser Rebbe, the Stoliner Rebbe, Rav Zalmanovich, the Rav of the Polish Estival in Williamsburg, who was a Talmud of the Sakachever, and particularly Rav Yitzchak Kutner, the Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva Rabbeinu Chai in Berlin. The Rebbe invited them all up to his private quarters, and as he was going up, he also motioned to me to join them. I was startled. I couldn't imagine why he would want me there at this particular time. However, in the course of his conversation with us, he mentioned that he had just received a letter from Zurich, Switzerland, from a member of the Fastag family. They were known to be Majit or Hasidim for many generations. The letter described a very poignant but tragic story from Azriel David Fastag. Hashem Yimach Demo, God should avenge his blood. On a cattle freight train traveling from Warsaw on its way to the infamous extermination camp Treblinka. He sang together with the hopeless, hapless Yidden Jews his song that he composed for the Ani Ma'amin. Ani Ma'amin, Bemuna Shalema, Bevia Samashiach, Be'afal Pishi Yismameha, Im Kolze, Achaket Lo Bechol Yom She'avo. I believe with complete faith in the coming of Mashiach, and even though he may delay, Nevertheless, I anticipate every day that he will eventually arrive. The letter also stated that after Israel sang together with this pitiful group being transported to their shore slaughter, he announced that if anybody should manage to escape from this train, I beg of you to learn this nigun and make sure to somehow have it reach his Rebbe, who is now safe in America. The Rebbe then handed over to me the sheet with the musical notation on it and said, Ben Sion, Lane, read. He told me to, re to read which of course I did. I can truly say there was no dry eye in the room as a result. The story doesn't end there. The Rebbe as a result became the biggest exponent of the Nigun and he would sing it at every occasion possible. I remember that sometime in 1945, Lubavitch opened the yeshiva. They arranged for a Malave Malka to celebrate the opening of the yeshiva and they invited the Majitsa Rebbe, Zichon Odi Varcha, may his memory be a blessing, the Rebbe accepted the invitation and he made it his business to speak about the anima min and sing it for the audience. I remember it very vividly. Let's hear Pantin Shanker singing just a little bit of this famous piece. <laughs> stop it here. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of music. Now, in the story of this nigun, we see the importance felt by some Jews during the war to write down nigunim using Western music notation. Recognizing that their lives were in grave danger, they turned to notation as a way to ensure that their beloved nigunim would survive. Through writing down the pieces, non-tangible cultural productions attain a physical form that stands a chance of surviving. Uh, the image comes to mind of baby Moses in a basket. The Nigunim are sent off into an unknowable future with the hopes that someone will catch them, find value in them, and maintain their lives. While the Majusa Rebbe began this project in a context characterized by threat, 
he saw its value and continued the project when he reached the relatively safe shores of America. Back in Brooklyn, Schenker's facility with music notation meant that he could play an important part in this musical preservation. Stanza three, Schenker as composer. As the musical secretary to the Mudgetzer Rebbe, Schenker absorbed the Mudgetzer canon. He had an incredible memory for melodies and retained everything that he absorbed. Inspired by the Nigunim that he was hearing from the Mudgetzer Rebbe, Schenker began composing his own Nigunim in 1941. Note that I'm jumping back just a little bit in the chronology here. Though Schenker was only around 16 years old at this time, these early Nigunim clearly show his skill in the genre. His first piece is titled Nigundol, that is, a little Nigun. As his student and friend Arne Orlander explained to me in 2022, the piece is very much in the style of Mudgets. Arne Orlander told me, the first Nigun he made sounds exactly like Rev Shaul. That's a real Mudgets or Nigun. That really goes on the line of Mudgets. Now, this similarity not only shows us his musical inspiration, but it also indicates that the young Ben Sion wanted to situate himself in this musical and social category. For a novice composer who was just 16 years old, the piece is an exciting glimpse into the musical legacy that would follow. Even among his early works, we see significant diversity. While some are of the short and highly singable variety, some of Schenker's early pieces were more of a cantorial recitative style. Some are, as we often think about Nigunim, uh, meant to be sung in paraliturgical settings, while others are to be sung during a prayer service. Thus, in Schenker's music, indeed in Hasidism more broadly, the word Nigun can apply to a diversity of melody types. This is perhaps an appropriate place to note that many of the Nigunim that I'm mentioning here are set to a specific text rather than being wordless melodies. In Majits, and in my experience across the contemporary Hasidic community, melodies that are set to words are considered to be nigunim just as much as their wordless counterparts. I once asked Shankar about why some Majits or nigunim are set to specific texts while others are not, and he offered a response that was rooted not in a discourse of spirituality, but instead in history. Here I'll quote him. I have an explanation. I never heard the Rebbe say this, but I have an explanation. Hasidic nigina, that's uh, Hasidic music, was never based on words. You sang a nigun, a nigun you could apply to anything you want. You could see it very often. You could sing it for Yitid Nefesh, you could sing it for Aa and Pifios. I mean, you could find three different texts and sing the nigun that the Rebbe made, not based on words. He made it for the Yom Narayan, but you could apply it to different places. Reb Meir Shapiro was the first Hasidic person, he wasn't a Rebbe, but he was a Rosh Yeshiva, to compose everything to words. And he taught it to the yeshiva boys in Lublin. Now I'll pause here, this is outside of his quote, to mention that he was the Rosh Yeshiva of a, um, a, a very important yeshiva in, uh, in Lublin and popularized what's known today as the Dafyomi Study Regiment. So back to Shankar's quote. Um, Those were the songs they used to sing and he composed quite a few songs. I think that was the catalyst that the Majus Rebbe started composing on words. He saw that it became a very popular idea. People were starting to sing nigunim with words, short nigunim with words, and he never had that type of nigun, so he started composing quite a bit of them. Now, in his own compositions, Schenker followed the Rebbe's lead. Some are wordless melodies and can therefore be applied to any number of texts, but many are specific in the text to which they should be applied. This can be partly understood, I believe, in the sense that Schenker wanted to make sure that music properly expressed the meaning of a liturgical text. As a Baltafila, that is a leader of prayer services, Schenker was dedicated to expressing the liturgy in the most beautiful manner he could muster, which involved a deep understanding of the emotional energy, we could call it, of the liturgy. And this skill carried over to his Nigunim, in which he strove to convey the meaning of the texts through the music. Now, there's a story to every one of Schenker's Nigunim. There are over 400 of them in total. But given our short time today, I'd like to simply play a mashup of just a few of his best known pieces from across his lifespan. I 
As a composer, Schenker was able to take the lessons he learned about Nivinim and apply them to his own compositions. As a composer, his positioning shifted from being a receiver and preserver of music of the past to being a contributor to the genre by creating new Nigunim. Schenker's Nigunim have ultimately been accepted by the Hasidic community as core pieces of their community's music culture. Stanza four. Shankar as recording artist. In 1947, Rabbi Shaul Yadid Yatal, the second Nazir Rabbi, moved from Brooklyn to Mandatory Palestine, leaving his Hasidim in New York to maintain the small synagogue that he'd established. Shankar became one of the leading figures in the small community, frequently leading services and managing the musical needs of the American Mudgets community. One of the main occasions for singing was the weekly third Sabbath meal, known as Udash Lishid or Shalashidas, held every Saturday night in the, uh, in the late afternoon. Sorry, every Saturday late in the afternoon. A group of regulars would attend the meal, including a gentleman named Benedict Stambler, a public school teacher by day who, with his wife Helen, would go on to record many of the most important figures of Jewish music during this era. Stambler approached Shanker, introduced himself, and asked Shanker if he'd ever considered recording Mudgets Nagunim. Shanker was taken aback by the inquiry. He'd never considered this. And furthermore, a professional recording of the Hasidic community's Nigun repertoire had never been produced previously. And it was unclear to Shanker whether this would be permitted as an acceptable Hasidic social practice. That is to say, whether or not it was appropriate for the music to be consumed by a recording. At first, Shanker simply said no, thinking that this would resolve the question. However, the inquiry had put an idea in his head, and he became interested in the possibility of releasing a recording of Majitz Nagunim. He wrote to the Majitz Rebbe, and at this point, that title now belonged to Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu Taub, the son of the previous Rebbe. The Imre Shahul had passed away shortly after arriving, um, and uh, his son took over. Ultimately, the Rebbe gave his permission to do so. Shanker set about working on the album, and in 1956 became the first to release a record of Nigunim. The album was very well received by listeners. Shanker relayed to me this comment in which a former classmate of his, uh, who had since moved to Buffalo, complimented the record by playing uh, on a verse from the biblical book of Proverbs, verse 25, 25. Shanker told me, quote, I got a letter from actually a rav, a rabbi, who years ago was a classmate of mine who now was a rav in Buffalo. I got a letter after he got this record and he said that it's Kemayim Karim al Nefesh Ayefa, like cold water on a tired soul. End quote. Here, Shanker's former classmate is implying the conclusion of this verse from Proverbs so is good news from faraway land. Now, following the success of this initial record, Shanker began working on a recording of his own Nigunim, which in Hebrew was titled the Kavid Shabbos, and in English, Joy of the Sabbath. 
The record was released in 1960 and included pieces such as Mizmor Le David and Asia Skyo, which we just heard. The success of the record undoubtedly contributed to the popularity of these melodies, as well as to Schenker's revered place in Hasidic music historiography. The use of recording technology we see enabled Schenker to spread the Nigumim to a much wider audience. Many of the pieces that Schenker included on the albums became hits. That is, pieces that are sung, frequently sung in synagogue, at home around the Shabbos table, or simply anywhere a person goes. The release of the album inspired other Hasidic groups, such as Chabad Lubavitch, Melitz, and Babav, to issue their own recordings of Nigunim. This became a way to preserve, celebrate, and, trans and transmit this music. Even more than with written notation, these pieces took on a life of their own, as the records could be sent anywhere at any time, reaching a wide audience who received the recordings warmly. For some, these recordings were their introduction to Majitz or Nigunim, while for others, they gave an opportunity to enjoy the pieces in their home as a recreational activity. This act of transmission, we see, changed the way that Nigunim could be consumed quite dramatically. Stanza five, the Artsite Suda. While some Hasidic recording artists developed vibrant careers doing concerts, Schenker disliked singing on stage. He felt that the proper venue for his music was the synagogue. In addition to his musical leadership on the Sabbath and holidays, Schenker regularly led Yartzeit Sudas, events honoring and remembering a deceased Rebbe on the anniversary of his death. While a full analysis of this type of event is beyond our scope today, a few features of these events are important for the consideration of transmission. It's customary at these events to share music composed by the Rebbe being honored and to teach the Torah commentary of the Rebbe. In some cases, particularly for the Kuzmir and Zvolin yard sites, the Rebbe did not leave behind sufficient musical material to program that, the, uh, the event. So I asked Shanker how we planned set lists on these occasions. He told me, and I'm gonna quote from him here. Right, so when it comes to the Kuzmir yard site and the Zvoliner yard site, I would choose Nagunim that were composed by different composers in the dynasty that were known as court composers. In other words, like Israel David Fastag, who we saw before with Animamen, he made a lot of Nagunim. The Rebbe used to sing his Nagunim. And you had Yanko Ruderman. Uh, the Nigun that I use for Yechad the Shehu is Yanko Ruderman. That's a masterpiece, that piece, you know? So I asked him, so it's not just any random Maditz Nigun. It's really, and he said, it's something that has a connection. So I asked him, so even if it's not the Rebbe's composition, it's something who's connected to him in some way? And he can see and tell me, yeah. And the Rebbe, the Imre Shaul, used to sing them also. I understand what I was told, that the Rebbe in Europe, while these composers were around, he never sang their Nagunim, he sang his own. And they themselves used to sing it. He would ask them to sing their Nagunim. He would appoint them to sing Kol Makadish, let's say, and they would sing their own Nigun. And he would ask them, what's that Nigun? And they would say, I just made it, or whatever they would say. So that's how he picked it up himself. He learned the Nagunim from them. But over here in America, after the Holocaust and when things became known to all the people were, that all the people were decimated. So on the contrary, he tried to sing more of their Nagunim for their Zikaron, for their memory. And he used to say very often that he's singing a Nugun of Fastag, Azrael David Fastag. At Yertzeit Serum of Sudas, it's customary to tell the story of the composition for each piece. Through this commentary on the Nigunim, the extra musical associations that are important to the community's history are shared, and the attendees become enculturated to the history of the community. This too, I would argue, is a form of musical transmission, as it communicates to those in attendance what's valued within the Majitz or music culture. In this way, both the Nigunim themselves and the history of the group are transmitted together to those in attendance. Shankar, as the leader of these events for decades, shared his musical and historical knowledge at these events, to the extent that even after his passing, there were individuals who had att attended his programs for years and were now ready to take on the leadership of the Yartzeit Suda. Let's get a sense of what his um, musical leadership sounded like. I'm gonna play just a very short clip here um, of uh, an event just before he passed away. This is in October 20th, 2016. Um, now, this is actually not strictly speaking a yard site suda. This was a kumzitz that happened on the holiday of Sukkot um, shortly before. But nonetheless, we're going to get a sense of uh, what his musical leadership looked like in this communal singing sort of um, environment.
So in concluding, I'll end with a coda. In this description of Ben Sam Shanker's life, I've tried to offer a sense of the many ways in which Shanker's actions and interactions contributed to Nigun transmission, both the Mudgets canon specifically, as well as the Nigun genre itself. Shanker's familiarity and ability with Nigunim was shaped through his early life, as seen in the musical skills fostered and developed by his mother, his singing Nigunim at the Shabbos table, his training in the choir, and his radio performances. It was shaped through his role as musical secretary to the Majitzer Rebbe, in which he preserved an, uh, endanger an endangered repertoire and learned the style from a master musician in the genre. It was um, shaped through his work as a composer as he wrote hundreds of Nigunim, including some of the best known pieces. Through his work as a recording artist, he disseminated the repertoire and shaped the aesthetics of the Nigun. And through his work as a performer of the Nigun in the synagogue, he in, uh, in turn, transmitted the music as well, both in paraliturgical and in liturgical settings. When we think about the diverse methods of transmission that can be found in this story, it's evident that, trans that the transmission of nigunim is more than just a chain. It is in fact a web of interactions, technologies and values that help to move the nigun genre across the ocean to America to find resources toward the preservation and continuation of the music and to help it thrive all the way to the present day. Within that web, though, Shanker was a highly significant energy source. He divide, devoted himself entirely to music and until his final day worked toward composing and spreading Nigunim. Today, Nigunim thrive in Brooklyn and other Hasidic communities around the world. Shanker's music is sung and recorded widely, and several of his Nigunim have become so ubiquitous that many don't even know their provenance. Seen within the web of transmission, perhaps we can understand this as evidence of Shanker's success in transmitting Nigunim as his music spreads throughout these networks broadly, reaching an ever-growing number of people who are enriched by their engagement with this music. I thank you for listening and I welcome any questions. Just a moment, I need to have my video turned on. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, we do already have questions coming in and I'm gonna do my best to, um, to bring you a selection of them. I wanna start with, there are a few different questions that are relating to the idea of transmission, not writ large from the old world to the new or from Europe to America, but between uh, and among people within a Hasidic context. So um, one of them is a question about how Nikunim, especially new ones, were taught or learned. Um, so you made reference to people not being able to read music. Um, I think the presumption there is that most people were not using sheet music, but can you speak to that a little bit? If there was a use of sheet music, and if not, what was the mode of teaching? Was it just start singing and then gather steam and join in, or was there a more formal instruction? Oh, you're muted. Thank you. Um, it's a great question. Um, yes, the um, primary method of transmitting Nigunim um, has long been um, oral transmission, particularly prior to um, Ben Sion Schenker's first recordings of Nigunim in the 50s. Um, then it was really about singing this music um, at gatherings and in services. Um, we often think about Nigunim as uh, paraliturgical music, music that it takes place outside of the, um, the synagogue service. But I would argue that a great number of uh, the Nigunim are actually uh, designed to be sung within the service itself or could be sung within the service itself. So synagogue attendance was a main way that, um, that Nigunim were transmitted. Um, and in addition, a feature of um, the uh, Hasidic community is what's called the Tish, which is when uh, the Rebbe holds a gathering um, in which uh, men gather together and sing pieces of music. So um, in Majits, um, the Rebbe's would compose uh, many of the pieces of music and they would sing them at the Tish and people would gradually pick up on them. Uh, and then of course, the more you sing that piece of music, the more it gets uh, ingrained in one's brain. Um, in other Hasidic dynasties, uh, the Rebbe was not a composer and they would have uh, court composers, as I referred to briefly in the talk. Um, and these were people who would 
uh, create a musical canon for that um, that dynasty. Now, after um, Schenker put out the first record of Hasidic music in the 1950s, and of course now we're, we're already on the shores of America, um, that set off a whole flurry of activity where many people were um, um, uh, releasing records of the music that was consumed that way. And also after the war, there was an effort to write down music. So uh, in Chabad, for example, they have Sefer Nigunim, which is a um, a set of uh, books of the um, the dynasty's Nigun canon. So later, especially after World War II, Nigunim came to be written down in musical notation, and it came to be transmitted via recordings, whether um, those sorts of recordings that are um, uh, commercially available, as well as handheld recorders uh, in the present day, and those are sent around. And today, um, many Nigunim are sent around uh, through MP3s and things like that. So it's been a, a, a transition over time. Voice memos, probably. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, this position of musical secretary that um, that Schenker um, obtained, was this a common, uh, do you know of other examples of people with that particular position? Did Remy's set up someone like him often to note their musical innovations? It's a great question. I don't know of anybody else who had that title. Um, I think that was just what uh, Schenker himself come, came to think of it as. Um, I don't know, maybe it could be that the Rebbe gave him that title specifically. I, I haven't heard of that, but it uh, could be. Um, but no, it was not a common one. There were court composers who would um, uh, um, create Nugunum for the Rebbe. But um, in terms of actually writing them down to document them, I think this was a rather unique office of Shanker. We can also say that the style in which he wrote them down, and um, he would also bring in Joshua Weiser to notate some of the, especially the more complex Nigunim, that style of writing them down, uh, down to the way that the, the letters are written, the handwriting, things like that, came to be a model for other Hasidic dynasties as well. So if you look at Sefer Nigunim, which I just referenced, the style of it is actually very much um, informed by uh, Weiser's work with the Majitzer Rebbe and Schenker's work with the Rebbe, and Weiser himself had a hand in uh, Sefer Niganim as well. So that style of transmission um, kind of emanated out of this work that I've described today. That's really fascinating. It uh, brings me to another question that someone has submitted. Um, that's about the whether you ever spoke with Schenker about uh, the question of the sort of the exactness or lack of exactness of notation. Um, there's obviously in in a lot of these performances or at least group singing contexts, there's a, there's um, a kind of stylistic almost messiness, right? How do you capture that? Um, is is that not captured in the musical notation, or how does one think about? Um, that relationship between the, the lived and performed music and what's actually written down? It's a great question. Um, I never asked Schenker specifically about those, um, uh, about the difference between how the music is sung and how the music is written. What I can say is that, um, well, a few things. Um, in Mudgets and Schenker himself, um, they're very um, particular that pieces should be sung correctly. Um, correct performance is very, very important and really valued. Um, I am recalling one event that I attended. It was a Malave Malka uh, in Borough Park in Brooklyn, um, in which Schenker actually brought a CD with him because he wanted to teach um, a new nigun and he wanted to make sure that people could hear the full uh, arrangement of it to understand the piece very well. So that was one way he taught. Um, at that same event, he stopped people who were singing his Hatov melody, which I played before. Uh, I played just a snippet of it. There's one part that people often sing incorrectly. And he actually stopped the crowd and he said, no, 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 you're singing it wrong. He did it very nicely. He said, you're singing it wrong. Um, it's it sung like this. And he stopped people so that it could be sung properly. Um, so he was very particular with that. And in his own notation, um, you can see he has a lot of... Um, uh, annotations about the proper performance of the music. So we tried to get it as close as he could um, to make sure that it would be delivered in the way that he wanted. Is that something that, so it sounds like you're saying that's something particular to the Mudzitz dynasty and it's connected to what you're describing as this sort of operatic flair of the music as opposed to um, what I think many of us imagine to be what Nigunim are like, which is a much more organic, um, 
rep repetitive um, sort of spiritual self-expression. There's a really huge distance between that kind of Nihun musical tradition and this um, this operatic and recorded and recorded and accompanied music. Yeah, I mean, to be clear, um, Ben Sion Schenker himself and in Majet's uh, compositions from the Rebbe and the court composers, they have many of those um, types of nigunim that you're referencing as well. Uh, shorter nigunim that can be sung on loop uh, with great repetition, uh, some in a faster dance sort of style and some in a uh, slower, more meditative kind of uh, style as well. So they absolutely do have that and it's valued and sung often within uh, Majet's. So they have um, they have both styles that are are there. Um, I will say though that there are other dynasties that um, that or at least individuals within the dynasties who are really particular about the way that the melody is sung, because especially if we think and there's much writing and discourse about this, if we think that the uh, about the nigunim is having mystical intents, right? These are um, these are this is music with the highest of ideals to connect oneself to God, right? And if one is to do that, proper performance is important. Now, we know that um, as with any repertoire, especially those that are transmitted orally primarily, there's going to be a, uh, a process in which the melody changes. And that's part of the nature of it as well. So um, uh, I would say it, it's implicit in the musical style. Amazing. I, I have a last, I think I'm gonna try to fit two more questions in, and then they both relate to, um, I think how, different aspects of reception of of this music so so one which is a question I think we hear often about Hasidic music and Hasidic nigunim and spiritual culture in general is is there any room for women in this musical culture did women sing these songs do women sing them can you can you connect to that yeah absolutely I'm glad that um you this class question was asked so we have the chance to open it up um, because it's something I wanted to get into in my uh, talk, but uh, time is short. Um, the, the first thing to say is, yes, absolutely. There are gatherings uh, uh, for women and by women in which um, Hasidic music is sung um, in these communities. Um, Nigunim can be part of them, especially um, as uh, in settings such as summer camps for girls, um, school uh, performances are a very big thing in the uh, Hasidic community and much of the right wing of the Orthodox community. Um, and it's part of the education system. So this, uh, so girls and women absolutely do sing this music. And there's a whole body of um, recordings that are commercially available that are by and for uh, women. My friend and colleague, Jessica Rhoda has, has a book coming out about this. Um, and um, so it, it, it does happen. Um, and Within Hasidism, there's a, a very strict um, there's there are strict uh, social rules about the separation of men and women. One of uh, and that has musical implications as well, which is why in these recordings we're not going to be hearing any uh, women singing. But the short answer is yes, absolutely. There's uh, there are women who sing nigunim. Uh, nigunim play an important part in their uh, in their lives. And um, and the other quick point that I want to say, I know we're running out of time, is that um, women are often the transmitters of um, of nigunim also to to children. So that behind the scenes sort of um, uh, no, behind the scenes is the wrong way to put it, but it's sort of um, something that's not publicly available. Um, that's an important component of um, of musical life than the Hasidic community. And some women, I. I are also composing and innovating their their own nigunim as well, right? Not not only transmitters. Yes, that, yes, that's true. Absolutely, um, and it's uh, it, it's a whole fascinating scene, um, and it's you know as I said, by and for the women of the community, which is um, uh, just fantastic. It's very interesting. Yeah. Okay. So even though we're a minute past the hour, the one the last question um, that I just want to lift up is someone asked whether the current generation of very young people is still perpetuating these these same traditions, these same melodies, um, the same aesthetics and and or innovating their own and contributing anew to the tradition. It's a great question. Um, the short answer is uh, yes. Um, while there's there are many forms of music, including um, pop music that's happening within the Hasidic community, 
um, there's uh, there is definitely interest in nigunim. Um, it's they are shared both in uh, domestic settings, but also in public gatherings such as the Artsite Suda's Kumsitzen that happen. And younger people are coming, and many of them know a tremendous amount about this music. It's really uh, very impressive to see. Um, so the music is um, is alive, and uh, I'm encouraged to see the young people are taking an interest in it. That's fantastic. And that's a great note to end on. I'll just say one that last thing, someone asked for a repetition of the name of your book, which I have as the Life and Complete Works of Rabbi Ben Zion Schenker. Um, so watch for that when it comes out. And I want to thank you again, Dr. Gordon Dale. Um, this was really wonderful. And um, the clips of music are are really bring so much of it to light, um, to life. So thank you for being here. Thank you to everybody who was here and who submitted questions. We had so many, I really only got to a tiny minority of them. So I wanna invite people to come back um, to our uh, talks for the remainder of this series where actually some of these issues get taken up. We have some about women singing in domestic settings. We have one about contemporary um, interpretations of Nigunim. So those are happening in January into February. And I look forward to seeing you all back here in this space. Thank you again.